Thank you for joining us for another online sermon from Redeemer. Matthew 18, Peter came to Jesus and asked, How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seven times, 70 times. This is the word of God. A while back, I read a biography of Jeffrey Dahmer. You remember who he was? Uh, yeah, he, he was, uh, uh, back in the 1980s, he killed something like 17 uh, different people in a very gruesome way. Before he was sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences, relatives of those who he killed had opportunities to speak to him. And many of them, of course, spoke heartbroken uh, uh, comments about how he had changed their lives and caused all kinds of stress and turmoil for those, those families, and of course, he did. But one mother began to speak quietly and deliberately. And as she continued to speak, her voice got louder and louder and louder, and finally she screamed out, I can never forgive you for what you have done. How could anyone forgive someone who is as brutal as Jeffrey Dahmer? Simon Weisenthal is a Jew who survived the Nazi concentration camps, but he lost 89 friends and family members to the Nazis in those camps. He shares some of his remembrances in a book entitled Sunflower. And one day a young Nazi soldier is dying and Weisenthal was near him and the soldier cried out to this man, to this Jewish man, and called Simon to his side. He took Simon's hand, and this Nazi soldier said, I have a confession. Some years ago, I helped herd some of your people into an old barn. We then ignited the barn and stood outside with a machine gun. When anyone tried to escape, we fired. Before I can die in peace, I need your forgiveness. Simon, will you forgive me? There was a long pause. Then Simon ripped his hand away and walked away from that dying soldier. Then Simon wrote 32 theologians and philosophers. He wrote them this question, did I do the right thing by not forgiving that Nazi? 26 of the 32 philosophers and theologians said, yes, you did the right thing. He didn't deserve to be forgiven. Only six said you should have forgiven him. Forgiving can be tough. When someone has really been nasty to us, we want them to suffer. We want them to pay. Sigmund Freud, the psychiatrist, once said, one must forgive one's enemies, but not before they've been hanged. <laughs> Comedian Jimmy Durante once said about an enemy, I couldn't warm up to that guy if we were cremated together. A millionaire owned an unusual lot in a large city. It was a few yards wide and 100 feet deep. He couldn't do anything with that lot. So he tried to sell it to one of the neighbors on either side. When neither of the neighbors wanted to buy that skinny piece of land. So this millionaire, in anger and bitterness because his neighbors would not pay for that piece of land, he built a house on that land, a few yards wide and a hundred feet deep, and he lived in that house the rest of his life out of spite for his neighbors. 
It later became called, it called Spite House. The millionaire would rather live in that house than forgive his neighbors for not buying that piece of land. Peter once asked Jesus about forgiveness. If someone keeps sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? If I forgive him seven times, would I be considered a really great forgiving person? And Jesus' answer still stuns us. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Hold on. If you're busy multiplying seven times 70 with toes and fingers, you're missing the point. Jesus wasn't teaching that we should forgive 490 times, of course. He was teaching this principle. We should be willing to forgive without limit. The Greek word forgive actually means to let go or put away. What we need to do with any of our grudges, our feelings of resentment, our attitudes for revenge, leave those attitudes behind. Not easy. To illustrate the principle, Jesus told a story about forgiving without limit. The story begins with a servant who owes his king 10,000 talents. Now, probably none of you have ever purchased anything with talents. So we need to translate. 10,000 is the largest number in the Greek language. We could translate 10,000 talents as millions and billions of dollars. If you own the bank accounts of Bill Gates and Donald Trump, you still wouldn't have enough money to pay back this debt. Now, we're not told how this servant accumulated such an enormous debt. Maybe he had the mentality of our American debt burden society. Comedian Bob Orban says it this way. Every time I look at my 15-room house, my new Cadillac, my three kids in Ivy League colleges, and my wife in her full-length mink coat, I can't help but take a reflective puff on my Corona cigar and think, why shouldn't I be $2 million in debt? Perhaps the servant thought, why shouldn't I be millions and billions of dollars in debt? Anyway, the king called the servant and demanded payment. Pay the debt back now. I want it all paid right now, even if you have to sell your wife and children into slavery. I want as much of that money back from you right now as you can scrape up. The servant says, wait a second, just give me a little time. I can pay it back if you just give me a little time. Fat chance. How's he going to raise millions and billions of dollars on a servant's pay? There's no way he could pay it back. Not in a lifetime. He is toast. But suddenly there's a shocking development in this story. The king says, you know, I'm in a good mood today. You don't have to pay back the billion trillion dollars that you owe me. I hereby cancel your debt. You don't owe one cent, no strings attached. Whoa, whoa, no question. The, the whopping trillion dollar debt is forgiven. Can you believe it? Can you imagine the servant's joy? It's like he won the lottery. He runs home to tell his wife and children that he doesn't have to sell them into slavery. Not run home, jump and skip and hop. He can't believe his luck. Well, it so happens he bumps into a guy who owes him a couple hundred dollars. What do you think he'll do? It's obvious. It's plain as the nose on your face. At least when you're not wearing a mask. 
He's been forgiven so much. We know what he'll do. He'll obviously forgive his friend the couple hundred dollars. It's obvious. The friend pleads, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. That should have jogged the servant's memory because those were the exact words he used when he spoke to the king. But in another shocking development, the servant demands the couple hundred dollars right now and says, if you don't pay, I'm sending you to prison. What is wrong with this man? To even ask for the money back is grossly insensitive. To imprison his friend is monstrous. The forgiven servant shows no mercy, no compassion. It seems unthinkable, even bizarre. And that is exactly the point that Jesus is making. To not forgive someone a little after you've been forgiven a lot is unthinkable, even bizarre. Well, the king hears what happened, and he has that servant brought before him, and he I forgave you trillions of dollars. Shouldn't you have forgiven your friend a few hundred dollars? Then the king reestablishes the servant's debt and sends him to prison. As Jesus finishes this story, I bet you could have heard a pin drop. Jesus then teaches, this is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Oh, does that, does that scripture make your blood run cold? We stand before our king of kings, like the servant stood before his king. We owe a debt that we cannot pay. The debt is the payment for our sins, and it is a staggering debt. And we have nothing to offer God. Because as sinners, we stand before him bankrupt. Yet in a shocking statement that seems so unbelievable, the king of king announces, your debt is forgiven, it's wiped clean, I've sent my son to pay the debt, no strings attached. God's grace is so stunning. I officiated at a wedding several years ago, and at the reception, the best man toasted the bride and groom with these words. The bride is stunning, and the groom is just stunned. Well, we ought to be stunned by God's generosity and grace. And now God is watching how we treat one another. Just as God has treated you and me better than we deserve, we are to treat others better than they deserve. Now, what will you do when you come across someone who has wronged you? I know what you'll do. You will forgive without limit. You will forgive with grace as God has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32, let's read it together. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Jesus was blunt. If we don't forgive others, our Heavenly Father won't forgive us. No matter how someone betrays us, disarrays us, or plays us, Our failures in the sight of God are even greater. If God forgives us, then we have no alternative but to learn to do the same. E.V. Hill, 
a great Baptist preacher, told the story about how he, he had been wronged and he planned to teach a lesson to the person who had wronged him. The Lord stopped him. The Lord said, I'm stopping you from hurting this person, from revenge. And Hill says, but he hurt me. And the Lord says, funny thing, Hill, I never tell you about all the times you have hurt me. I just sit down and ask you, how are things going, Hill? How's the family? Hill commented, the next time I saw that guy, all I could say is, how are things going? How's the family? To hold on to bitterness and hatred is easy. To release it and to extend forgiveness is not natural. It is supernatural. It takes the grace of God, but God's grace will help us forgive. Once we have forgiven, then comes something that may be even harder. Overcome evil with good. I looked for the Bible passage that reads, Jesus washed all the disciples' feet except for Judas. But I couldn't find that Bible passage. What a passionate moment when Jesus silently lifted the feet of his betrayer and washed them in the basin. Within hours, the feet of Judas, cleansed by the kindness of Christ, would stand at Caiaphas's court, demanding 30 pieces of silver. Soon after, while hanging on the cross, Jesus returned good for evil, loving and forgiving his tormentors, bearing their sins, dying for them. And three days later, he rose from the dead to give life. All who would come to him, he will not turn any of them away. When we forgive without limit, when we return good for evil, we are a living picture of God's grace to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. pray that you are inspired by this message. Please join us again next week for another online sermon from Redeemer.